Hello, I'm Zola Levitt, and we're going to have something old and something new on this program. We'll start in Jerusalem, where you can overlook the interesting and beautiful city of Bethlehem. And then we'll zip into cyberspace to talk with the CEO of Israel's largest internet provider, NetVision. Shalom. Hello again. Welcome to our new series, This is Israel. And this is Israel behind me on this map. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this is the country of Israel. The yellow line here marks uh, what is being called the West Bank, which is actually uh, the provinces in the Bible of uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, this line marks the Gaza Strip, where uh, Arafat's government and the Palestinians uh, are living. And... Uh, Jerusalem is here in the center, and Bethlehem just five miles south of it right there. And uh, we're going to go there. You know, uh, the point of this series is to display the often ignored side of Israel, which is its ingenuity, its know-how, its beauty. Uh, the kind of news you get in America on, on CNN and so on, uh, uh, it, it just always shows uh, uh, some trouble spot, something like that. And, and after a while, um, and people start to think of Israel that way. It, it's really not at all fair. So uh, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and from there, a kibbutz on the southern side of Jerusalem, Ramat Rachel, which has an excellent view of the little town of Bethlehem, where, of course, our Messiah was born. Here we are at a true place of birth. In back of me, you see the little town of Bethlehem. That's our location just across on a southern hill in the uh, southern suburbs of Jerusalem. And from uh, this kibbutz, from Atrachel, we can look at the towers and spires of that little town. Bethlehem in Hebrew is a Beit Lechem, house of bread. And that's very significant to those that read uh, the New Testament, that the Lord is uh, really a piece of bread. This bread is my body. I am the bread of life. And he was buried on unleavened bread and so forth. Uh, that is a Jewish feast, the second feast, unleavened bread, the second night of Passover. Well, it's a historic place. It's a very ancient city. Uh, there is a statue here of the kibbutz of Rachel with her two children. She died here in childbirth, and her tomb is here. That's uh, uh, an alleged site, but it's uh, where, where Rachel is remembered, and uh, uh, people visit all the time. Uh, here it was that uh, Naomi had her needs met in famine. Here it was that she had hope when her uh, daughter Ruth uh, converted to the Jewish faith and said, uh, your land will be my land and your God will be my God. And uh, here is where Ruth met Boaz and uh, they married. And uh, their offspring, Obadiah, then Jesse, then one of the great figures of antiquity, King David uh, of their line. And finally, of course, on down to uh, the Lord himself, the present reigning king of the Jews. Uh, David was anointed here. Uh, you recall the scene in 1 Samuel 16, 13, the prophet comes to uh, anoint the new king of Israel while, during Saul's reign, but uh, it was the custom to uh, announce the next king, and uh, uh, Jesse had many suggestions. He had eight sons, and of course he started with the oldest, but the prophet was uh, uh, appointed to actually do the youngest son, uh, rather as in the case of Jacob and Esau or Abel and Cain, the younger was the, the preferred, the youngest of all. David, the shepherd lad, to playing on a pipe and composing poetry and caring for his sheep, uh, became anointed as the next uh, king of Israel. Micah, the prophet, honored this little town of Bethlehem in an unforgettable verse in Micah 5, 2. 
Uh, but thou, O Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, out of you will come he who is to be king for everlasting, and so on, whose goings forth are from everlasting. Uh, the, uh, the Lord was born here, of course, at a time when uh, this was still a smaller town than it is now. It's not a big town now. But uh, when the king was born uh, to a virgin bride here, there were only 400 families in Bethlehem. That's not a very big town. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that is a reason that the Lord was born here, uh, that it would be a birth that would be noticed. You know, in a small town, when, when uh, young kids ride in practically, high school kids engaged, and the girl is, uh, is pregnant and about to deliver, why, that's news. Uh, uh, when a girl has a, a baby in a, in a, in a what well, we call it a barn, it really was a cave where they keep cave. the animals with a fire at the entrance. The uh, when she Jesus has a, a baby in circumstances like that, why, people of the town must tell each other, why doesn't somebody do something? And they, somebody probably did, and they probably brought blankets and cared for them and so forth. And in that manner, there was a birth to be remembered. Thirty years later, uh, uh, an honest questioner like a Nicodemus might come to Bethlehem and say, look, I've heard the teachings of this magnificent uh, Galilean who they claim walks on water and heals the sick and raises the dead. But for me to make the step to believe that he is truly the Messiah of Israel, that's a big step. And uh, I'd like to know, since uh, Micah said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in your little town, can you remember, was he born here? And of course, people would say, who could forget it? Yes, uh, uh, his mother and dad rode into town. They, they were engaged. Uh, they weren't really even married yet. And uh, then uh, Nicodemus or the whoever questioned would say, uh, uh, the, the Isaiah said she w that he was to be born of a virgin. Uh, what can you tell me about that? Well, they could say, well, she was a young girl. She was a good girl. They weren't married yet. Uh, that's a lot of evidence. That's, that's the way they used to find the Messiah, with the evidence out of the Old Testament. Uh, you know, we've lost the skill of witnessing out of the Old Testament alone, but that's what Peter did and what Paul did and what every one of them in the first century did. They used their Old Testament to prove the Messianic prophecies. They must have used Isaiah 53, as, as Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. The, by his stripes are we healed. He's intercessor for our transgressions. If they could calculate uh, Daniel 9, they must have used that. This is the time that Messiah should come in the 70 weeks of years prophecy and, and many others. Others, and uh, they had the skill of witnessing from the Old Testament. Well, uh, Bethlehem went on after his birth as a, a place of spiritual renewal and, and rebirth. Uh, Christianity flourished here uh, in the Holy Land. The Latin Bible was composed in 386 A.D. Uh, by Jerome, uh, the Vulgate Bible, uh, still in use in some places. Uh, the fourth century saw the building of the oldest church in the land, the basilica called the Church of the Nativity, where they claim the manger is located. I'm not sure that's true because it's in the middle of the city square and more likely the Lord was out in the fields. After all, animals attended the birth and it was a farm or a ranch sort of that he was, uh, he was born on. But uh, in any case, this church was built to commemorate it, and the church uh, was the site of much argumentation. It has a very low doorway uh, to keep horsemen from uh, riding into the church and up and down the aisles, lopping off heads in the home of the Prince of Peace uh, to uh, <laughs> contend for their side. There has been much contention and much strife, and it seems a shame in a place where uh, the one who is ultimately to bring peace on earth, goodwill to men, was born. Thus saith the Lord God, I shall gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. You shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel. Uh, we're on location across from the little town of Bethlehem where Jesus Christ was born, where David was anointed, where Rachel died in childbirth, an ancient and important city. And uh, we have talked about the birth of Christ and what happened thereafter, the building of the church, the nativity, and so on. 
But then uh, the town went through a lot of changes because, after all, the Muslims rode in. Uh, they controlled Jerusalem starting in uh, 632 A.D. They built the Dome of the Rock. They finished it in 691. Uh, they held sway here for centuries. For twice the, the age of the United States, the Muslims uh, held on to the area. Christian armies of Europe came here, the Crusaders, trying to wrest the Holy Land from the Muslims. They rode through the place uh, uh, killing people, Jews and Muslims alike. Uh, they did not have a very good reputation, certainly not a very religious reputation. Uh, and they uh, uh, took over the land. They, they put the Knights Templar on the temple site. They, in an awesome example of failing to read your Old Testament, they thought the Dome of the Rock was King Solomon's temple, if you can imagine. And they put a cross on the top of the thing, making a church out of it. And that was rather amazing, since it had originally been built over the old Roman temple of Jupiter, which itself had replaced the temple of God, the Jewish temple. We now had a Christian cross on a Muslim dome, on Roman pillars, on Jewish land. That's what happens in the Holy Land. Uh, the Crusaders held the place for two centuries or so. Uh, the Mamelukes from Egypt rode back in, other Muslims. They took over. Finally, the Turks rode in, 1517. Still other Muslims. They took it over. All this time, the Jews are, are dispersed and the Christians too far away to object. And uh, the Turks held sway until 1917. Uh, at the end of World War I, General Allenby of the British Army, without firing a shot, got off his horse and walked respectfully into Jerusalem on his feet and took the city over from the Turks and uh, established the British Mandate. In the same year, Lord Balfour of the uh, British Parliament said that the Jews have a perfect right to reestablish their homeland here, and that was a historic moment indeed. The Jews did start to come back, and uh, they started to farm this place at last. Somebody living in the land cared about it. Uh, you know, I can't say much about the Turks. They cut out the forests. They turned the place into a desert, into swampland. They seemed never to plant a tree. They chopped out all the trees to make ties for their famous railroads, but they never replaced the trees, and so the silt uh, went into the harbors. The, the place was in ruination when the first Jews came back. But they turned out to be among the best farmers in the world. They drained the swamps. They planted the place. Uh, in the 1960s, they were the first in the world to use drip irrigation, computer-controlled water dripping on each plant uh, just enough. And uh, lately, they grow roses by using the water twice. It goes through the stone and comes out of the bottom and back up through the top and so forth. And uh, they have really made this place into an exporter of food and, as a matter of fact, an exporter of roses, as I pointed out in the previous uh, program. Uh, Isaiah predicted the desert shall blossom as a rose, and indeed it does. Now then, Theodore Herzl, the great Zionist, and Ben Yehuda, the lexicographer, recreated the language of Israel. Uh, when the Jews started at Quebec, they spoke a uh, hundred languages. They spoke uh, uh, Russian, like my parents. They spoke uh, Yiddish. They spoke the uh, languages of the countries they came from. Uh, and and they, these two felt that they ought to speak the biblical language. And for the first time in, in human history, a dead language so-called, I mean, it was used for prayer but never for conversation, uh, was resurrected and new words put into it. And it was used every day for conversation in the streets and in the stores. And Hebrew was recreated. The principle here <laughs> is given way back in the beginning of the Bible. Uh, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. That was the case then. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they've imagined to do. And he proposes that they confound the people's language, and so they all are speaking different languages suddenly. They have to abandon their project, and it says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. They, they gave up trying to build this tower to reach to heaven. And uh, it says, therefore, is the name called Babel, which in Hebrew is the word for uh, confusion, uh, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Well, uh, Herzl and Ben Yehuda did the opposite. They recreated a language, gave them all back one language who spoke different languages from all over the earth. And now uh, they were back, and they have stayed, of course, for decades. 
Uh, Israel is now in its uh, uh, sixth decade. It's just past its 50th anniversary. In 1948, when uh, the Jews be declared independence, well, I would call that the decade of independence. Uh, they made their declaration just like America did in 1776. And of course, they were fallen on by, by five Arab nations. Uh, the Arabs came from all sides with well-equipped armies against 650,000 Jewish people, uh, many armed only with handguns, some not armed at all. And, uh, and they lost, the Arabs lost. Uh, somehow the Israelis held the land and they uh, established their independence. Then in the 50s, uh, the immigration began in real earnest and the 650,000 people became uh, two and a half million. It was a tremendous influx of Jews from all over the world come back to build the promised land. In the 60s, uh, the Palestinians or the Arabs co-opted the term Palestinian for themselves and uh, uh, began the PLO, an idea of uh, uh, liberating so-called the land from the uh, Jewish inhabitants. Since they'd been there, as we conceded, the Muslims had been there for centuries also, but the Jews predated them by so long. And uh, in any case, they wanted to liberate the land. A six-day war occurred, and that when the Jews captured Jerusalem. That was the decade of war and Jerusalem, I would say. The 70s, the decade of the Arab boycotts. Remember, we stood in line to buy gas because the Arabs held back the oil, blamed the uh, thing on the Israelis. Uh, the Israelis make Arabs do bad things. And uh, the press, the American press and the world press in general, turned against Israel. And it's against it to this day, bashes it every day. And uh, this, this is decimating uh, a modern democracy, uh, an ally of the United States. Uh, and it goes on and on. It's been very effective. The, the Arab PR machine it goes on and on, and uh, Israel suffers. In the 80s, the Intifada began with the children throwing stones. Arafat and his people had nothing to do with that. They were caught totally by surprise at this spontaneous uprising, but they claimed it and, and then decided there had to be peace conferences to settle this uh, issue. And uh, so a what was a really ghetto riots, which we have all the time in the United States, uh, became some kind of war that had to be settled with peace conferences. And so we have the 90s, the decade of false peace. That should herald the entrance of the Antichrist, the master of false peace, uh, coming up. Well, today Israel is a total success. Otherwise, its income is equal to that of England per capita. It is much wealthier and more important than any Arab nation. Uh, even the ones with, with uh, enormous amounts of oil uh, still don't feed themselves as the Israelis do. And uh, Bethlehem behind me was given over to the Muslims in 1995. I suppose we would be in the city square in Bethlehem filming if it were still an Israeli-controlled city, but now it's a, it's a city that's got some danger involved. It's not much fun to visit. Uh, you hear construction going on here, by the way. The birth goes on. This place is still being reborn and reborn as they build newer and newer buildings, uh, still remaking the land. And uh, Bethlehem is lost to the Palestinians some time back. Har Homa, where some of this building is taking place, is uh, just off the hill to my right. And uh, there, of course, uh, was a tremendous controversy about the building of some apartments. But as I say, the rebirth goes on. The borders of Jerusalem are really coming up for serious discussion. And, uh, well, you know, Jews and Arabs have been moving in for years. Uh, the city has swollen up. Uh, the real estate values are very high. The population of the whole country has grown by a third in 10 years. Imagine that. Uh, gosh, it, it would be like another 100 million people coming into America in the next 10 years. Uh, Israel has a tremendous burden here. And, of course, much more usage of all its services, including computer services, our producer, Ken Berg, visited the home offices of NetVision and spoke to the CEO, Ruth Alon. Ruth, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Can you give us a background on, on NetVision and its extraordinary growth and where you're going? Yes, uh, NetVision is uh, five years old now. Uh, we were founded in uh, 1994 by NetManage. And, um, we got our license in August, started selling uh, accounts in uh, August of 94. Uh, and uh, today we're the leading company. We have uh, many, many tens of thousands of customers. And uh, we have a wonderful, exciting business. 
and we're trying to ride the wave of internet with the rest of the world. There's probably about 20% of the customers that are younger, and uh, the others are uh, the typical, uh, maybe more educated, and uh, uh, somewhere around the 20 to 45 is the, the typical user. Well, in what ways would you consider Israel a leader in cyberspace today? I think that probably the number of uh, new ideas and new ventures and new technologies and uh, the innovation that, that goes with it, that we must be leader, uh, especially if we take uh, it in, as a percent of the uh, population of the country. Uh, there is a, a huge number of uh, new ideas and uh, people, young people, older people, a lot of money that's invested in trying to come up with uh, new technologies and new offerings. And uh, I think we're quite unique in that. Why do you think that's the case? I mean, Israel's a relatively small country, but yet so much is coming out of Israel. Well, there's, there's probably several reasons for that. There's the classical reasons that uh, Israel has always been uh, uh, known for well being a well-educated uh, country with a high, very high percent of uh, people that uh, graduate high school, that continue to academic degrees of uh, different kind. And the other thing is probably because we're a small country and we are a little far away, and it's very important for us, and uh, everybody wants to be connected uh, with the world. And there's nothing like the Internet to connect and, and make us all uh, one uh, nice global uh, village. Perhaps part of your survival, that you need to stay in touch with the world. I think it's uh, very important for Israel because uh, certainly what, uh, what the future brings is hopefully peace and good economics and good uh, employment for people and and uh, export is very important for Israel and we we need to be a part of the world and we are a part of the world there's nothing like the internet that does it as we speak we can hear construction going on <laughs> right next door it's kind of a symbol it's symbolic isn't it in the way of, of the growth of this country not only in cyberspace or just in general it's a dynamic country Yes, it's very dynamic. Uh, there's a building all the time and it comes and goes as we can see. That's okay, we get used to it, but it's fun. <laughs> Where would you say the information highway is taking us? What ultimately is down the road? Would you say in five years? It's, uh, there's probably going to be very little that will not be somehow connected to something. Uh, we like to say in, sometimes in the lectures uh, the story about how you, your shirt will have this uh, little uh, transmitter in it that will tell the laundry that, you know, the laundry mat that it's dirty and it's time to take it to the wash and it will also tell you when it's uh, clean. I think the, the, uh, it's going to ch really change uh, everybody's life even more than what we can see now and hopefully for a good way. And I certainly hope it will have a big impact on, on the new generation, on education, on the ability to bring the good, wonderful things that, that kids need to know about and explore and not just sit there and listen to lectures anymore. Unfortunately, the image that we have in America is not often the best of Israel because of the news. Uh, do you think that the internet may have something to do with changing that down the road? Hmm. Well, we sure hope so. Um, uh, I think that uh, anything that makes people talk with each other is good and, and have open forums to discuss things and, and do it in a in a uh, civilized manner. Uh, we have a lot of uh, users that uh, speak other languages than Hebrew. Actually, here in our technical support group, we support uh, on a regular basis in four languages, in Hebrew, in English, in Arabic, and in Russian. And our new portal, Nana, which we just launched uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, is also supporting all four languages. And we put a lot of emphasis now on the Arabic. Uh, side of it and uh, we're going to put more content into it and it's going to be addressing the Israeli Arab population and hopefully you know people around us and uh, we definitely think that it could have a good effect on communicating more and maybe starting to trade and, and uh, see the economy affected by it as well on both sides.
Modern Israel is a story of something new and something very old. You know, as much as they are advanced in computer technology and medicine and science, agriculture and so on, they are the oldest country in the world. Why do I say that? China, you say, is older and so on. Yes, but they've changed their religion, their philosophy a hundred times. I've said this before, but I mean, what would a, an ancient Confucian have to say to a, uh, a Chinese communist of today? Uh, in Israel, uh, uh, if Zephaniah came walking down the street after nearly 3,000 years and spoke to the people, he'd speak the same language, giving the same thoughts about the same God, the same prophecies, the singing the same songs, doing the same prayers they were doing from time immemorial. My goodness, God said to Abraham, I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Genesis 12, 2, and, and it's come to pass. It certainly has come to pass. Get to know this country. It's well worth knowing. Um, we're offering maps as our offer. This is interesting. If you have a map of a country or a major city, uh, you get to know it quite well. We have two maps, one of Israel and one of Jerusalem, typically that we use uh, with our tours. We've offered them for years. They're very complete. The map of Israel has all the cities and the roads and the, the provinces and so on, so you understand it. And the map of Jerusalem is a picture map. It has uh, street names. I mean, you could just spend hours and hours looking at this kind of a map. It's different than an American city. Uh, there are no expressways. Uh, there are uh, <laughs> there are buildings uh, 1,500 years old, 1,300 anyway, the Dome of the Rock. There are walls uh, that go back to King Solomon. The bottom of the western wall goes that far back. So uh, get these maps and uh, study them. You'll like them. And uh, get our Levitt letter and our catalog. Our newsletter and catalog are free for the asking. Send us your name and address, and we'll send them uh, right to you. I hope you will do that. Remember the gifts of funds. I mean, that's how any ministry really operates. This is not a store. Uh, we need your help, uh, like any church would need your tithe. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you.